Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading at verse 8 and read 8 through 14. And it starts off with Jesus risen from the grave is talking to his disciples. And this is what it says. It says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said this, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Then they returned from Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Pray with me. Lord, this day, this time, breathe your spirit on us that we may hear. And Lord, that we may see. Lord, that we may speak as your children, your sons and daughters. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Little girl went to her mom said, Mom, where did the human race come from? Her mom said, well, God made Adam and Eve, and then they had children, and then they had children, and they had children, and that, that's, that's how it began. I said, oh, okay. Then a couple of days later, she was with her dad, and she said, Dad, where did the human race come from? He said, well, a long, long time ago, there were monkeys. And these monkeys, over time, they developed and they evolved into to humans. And she said, okay. And then she went back to her mom. She said, Mom, I'm, I'm confused. I said, you said that, that God made Adam and Eve and, and they had children. Dad said monkeys. And her mom said, don't worry. She said, it's very simple. I was talking about my side of the family and your father was talking about his. <laughs> well, it's confusing. When we get our, our theories and our ideas, Starting with theories and ideas, things often get confusing. That's not where the early church started on theories and ideas. The early church started through a fact, something that they had all experienced, that Jesus walked the face of this earth and they saw, they heard, they walked with Him, they taught with Him, they ate with Him. They saw that He said and did the things that only God can do. That He was crucified on the cross. He was dead and He was buried. 
They were witnesses to that. They saw it. And the one fact that the, that the church, the church is founded on is that he rose from the grave. Now, it wasn't a, a hunch or a theory that he rose from the grave, that he met with those who had seen him alive. He met with those as the risen Christ. 1 Corinthians said he met with as many as 500 at one time. At the end of the book of Luke, Cleopas and another disciple are walking along the Maus Road and they're, they're talking with them. And they didn't recognize him as the, the risen Christ at first. It wasn't until later on in Breaking of Bread that they looked back and they said, that was Jesus who walked with us. It was times like this where he met with his disciples. Other times where he met with them on the Sea of Galilee. Other times when he, he met them behind closed doors. Other times where the women he met with them at the, at the, at the tomb. That, that's the one fact that they, that they gave witness to. And this is the way that it starts out. That the risen Christ is telling them that he's going to ascend into heaven, but that he's going to come back. And they were to wait in the city until they're given power. The power of, of his risen spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. And this would not only change the world forever, it would change their lives forever. That this is the one fact that the church is founded on. The risen Christ. And that these are to be witnesses to the facts. Not witnesses to hunches and theories, but witnesses to the facts. And then maybe the witness starts before they ever open their mouths. Here we have the witness of the names of all the disciples that were there listening to, to Jesus speak. Now it's 11 of the 12. Jesus, uh, Judas hung himself after Jesus was crucified. So it names off the 11 who were there and, and, and spoke to the to Jesus risen from the grave. And, and this, these are their names. It says, And it was Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew. Matthew. Matthew was called by Jesus out of the tax office from his hometown. As Jesus walked by the tax office, he, he saw Matthew and said, Follow me. And Matthew did. Well, most of us think, well, if he got a job as a tax collector then he must have applied for the job. Well, that wasn't the case. Tax collectors bid for the job. And the job went to the highest bidder. The one who paid the most money received the authority from the Roman government. They collaborated with the Roman government in order to take the taxes from folks. That They didn't just count the money. They took the taxes from folks. They had the power of the Roman army to take the tax from the people, from the people that the Romans had conquered. And that's why Matthew was there in the tax office, office because he was a, a tax collector collaborating with the Roman government. And the Roman government only required the amount of tax that they required. Anything over and above that, the tax collector could keep if they could get it. Tax collectors were rich, not a little rich, very rich because they took all the money they needed and some. Matthew was a tax collector, and he was listed here among the disciples. This book was written between, scholars believe, between 68 and 72 A.D. The temple of Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the very ones who occupied Jerusalem occupied Israel. It was the Romans who destroyed the temple. And Matthew, who had collaborated with the Romans, was listed among the, the disciples. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were the Sakari. And the word Sakari means dagger carrier. They carried a dagger and they'd made a pledge that they would kill anyone who had collaborated with the Roman government. 
And that their number one target, you guessed it, tax collectors. That they had pledged to kill a tax collector whenever they had the opportunity. Simon was a zealot. Matthew was a tax collector. Not only are they, they listed among the disciples here, but the very next verse, verse 14, says, These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. Matthew and Simon were witnesses. Witnesses. And they were of one mind. Well, my hunch is they weren't of one mind about politics. My theory is they didn't sit around talking about the virtues of how, what wonderful roads the Romans were able to make. They weren't talking about the, the, the virtues of, of Pax Romana and how the strong Roman government had kept peace throughout the land and no, no little tribal wars were breaking out. No, they weren't talking about that. They were of one mind about something far, far greater, something far, far more important, not only to them, but to the world to all of history, to you and me. Well, Acts chapter 4 goes just one step further than that. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. So it wasn't only of one mind. They were of one heart and one soul. And it goes on in verse 33 to say, And with great power the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. Matthew and Simon were witnesses. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Well, what were they witnesses to? Well, that's what it says here in verse 33. They were witnesses to the power of the resurrection. With great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. That that's the the fact that the church is built on. That's the first thing I want to talk about this morning, the power of the resurrection. Bobby Ross, before he was the the coach at Georgia Tech of their national championship team, he uh, was special teams coach of the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, being special teams coach meant that he spent a lot of time with the kicker, and the kicker was Jan Stenerud. They would often, he would often coach him on on kicking balls through the the uprights and and landing his, his... kickoffs in certain parts of the end zone and certain parts of the field for different situations. And when they would practice kicking, that um, they would need ball boys to get the the balls from over the fence after he kicked them through the the uprights to to bring them back so they can continue to practice. Well, this particular day, there weren't any ball boys around, but there were these two guys that Bobby Ross said they were grubby looking guys that would come to practice fairly often to watch Jan Stenrud kick field goals. And he asked these two guys, said, do you mind shagging balls over the fence while we practice here? Well, after Jan had kicked a, a few field goals and, and over the fence, he turned to Bobby Ross and said, Coach, do you know who one of those guys was? And uh, Bobby Ross said, no, I didn't know either one of them. He said, one of those guys was George Brett. George Brett is one of the greatest baseball players of all times, and he was playing for the Kansas City Royals. That's when Bobby Ross said, that may be the most expensive ball boy of all time. (laughs) Well, I've got a story that tops that one. The God of this universe became flesh and blood and walked this earth for you and for me. That Jesus was put to death on a cross for you and for me. And he rose from the grave. He rose from the grave to give you and me power. Power over sin. Power over fear. The power that conquered death is the same power that not only conquers sin and fear and shame. Conquers guilt. It gives strength and weakness. It's the same power that gives love in the middle of bitterness. It's the light, the light in the darkness. That's the power of the resurrection. And Matthew, Simon, a collaborator and an assassin, came to give witness to that power that not only was it strong enough, strong enough to to overcome the darkness, it was strong enough to make 
a collaborator, an assassin, one mind, one heart, and one soul. If ever there were a time this, this world needed to know the witness to the power of the resurrection, now is that time. And I do believe, I do believe that you and I were called to be such a witness. The apostles, Matthew, Simon, they were witnesses. They were witnesses to the power of the resurrection. But not only to the power of the resurrection, it tells us here in verse 33, they were witnesses to the, Jesus as Lord. It says that, the, and with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Peter in his first sermon said it more succinctly, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That when Jesus is Lord, it means that we don't use that kind of talk much these days because we don't have lords, we don't have kings. That, that, that the Lord is the king, the one that, that all of life is, is oriented through. That the Lord is the leader of our lives. And when we, we, we come to that certainty, when we come to that, that realization... And, and begin to orient all of our lives around Jesus as Lord, all of life is changed. Not just 2,000 years ago, but today as well. It was about 110 years ago, I graduated seminary. And when I was sent to one of my first church, it was a church kind of out in the middle of nowhere. I'd been there about two weeks, and a member told me that there was another member that was in the church, that he had cancer, and he was in the hospital, and he had cancer and that he didn't have long to live. Well, I went to the hospital to visit this man. And when I got there, sure enough, he couldn't respond at all. And uh, the nurse told me that his wife and sister and son were at the end of the hall. Well, I stepped out into the hall and I could identify only three people at the end of the hall that might be his wife, his sister, and his son. Well, I was walking down the hall. And I saw the one that looked like it might be his son. He looked like he was in the early 30s, maybe yeah, or late 30s, maybe early 40s. He had a beard down to about right here. He had on a, a black Harley Davidson t-shirt with a Harley belt buckle and his cigarettes rolled up in his sleeve. He looked like he was just about the fiercest person I've ever seen in my life. He could have bitten a head off with, without a, a, a glance or a, an effort. I, he just looked like a mean person. Well, I walked up and I introduced myself to, to the three of them. And um, immediately one of the women said, Oh, preacher, won't you pray for us? And that's when he looked up at me. And he pointed the butt end of his cigarette at me. He said, Preacher, I don't want to hear a word you got to say. And that's when one of the women said, Oh, Gary, you don't mean it. Preacher, pray with us. Well, my first prayer was under my breath. Lord, help me not get the stuff and beat out of me. And then I began to pray. And as soon as I started to pray, he walked away. I stayed there with the man's wife and sister for a while, and then I went to go find Gary. He was in another part of the hospital, and uh, he was smoking a cigarette. And, and as I walked up, he saw me from a distance. He said, young fella, he said, and he pointed the butt of his cigarette at me again. He said, it's nothing against you. I just don't want to hear anything you got to say. That's when I said, I'm not here to talk. I'm here to listen. I went over and I sat with him. Not too close, mind you, but I sat with him. And after a little while, he began to talk. And he said, my father is the toughest man I know. There's not anything he couldn't overcome. And now it looks like this cancer's got him. Well, he was right. His father was tough. That they thought his death was imminent, but he hung on for, for two more weeks. And during those two weeks, I would go back and I would visit with family, and I would sit with Gary, and Gary began to tell more stories. And all of his stories included something about him either being in a biker gang or about him getting in a, a bare-knuckle fight or about him shooting someone or a, he told a story about him pistol whipping. I didn't even know what it was, just getting a pistol in your hand and smacking somebody with it. He told stories about people would give him money to beat up somebody at a bar, and it's not that he was bragging. These were just all the stories that he had. 
Well, after the funeral, I didn't see or hear from Gary for a long time. It was probably about eight or nine, eight or nine months later that I got a call about eight o'clock at night, and it was Gary. His voice sounded different, and he said, can you come by my trailer? Well, I lived in the middle of nowhere, and he lived about 10 miles past it. I went to his trailer, I knocked on the door, and when he opened the door, he didn't look the same. It was obvious he was in pain and he was gritting to overcome the pain. He said, come on in. I said, are you okay? He said, no, I'm not. He said, my best friend was shot and killed in a bar last night. He said, my father's dead. And he said, I tried to quit drinking liquor for the first time since I was 15 years old. And look at me. And his hand was just shaking like that. He said, my gut's on fire. And he was just holding this side, trying to keep down the pain. And he said, I don't know what to do. I said, I don't know either. I said, but Jesus does. Well, that night, we prayed. We prayed that Gary received for certain that Jesus was Lord of his life. And at the end of the prayer, Gary said, do you feel it? I said, yes. He said, no, Jesus is real. I said, yes. It's not just an idea that he's real. I said, yeah, I know. That's, the, that's his Holy Spirit here. He said, you could have told me, and I'd have never believed it. He said, it's real. Jesus is real. I said, that's right. Well, the, that started a miracle in Gary's life, but the real miracle came in the, the, the weeks and months after that. He would come by the house fairly often, and it was about a, a week or two after that, he came by the house and he said, um, he said I quit my job. I said, why did you do that? He said, he said, everybody I knew there took drugs, and I couldn't stay off drugs and stay in that job, so I quit my job. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. I'll find something. There was a peace about him, even with not having a job, not having prospects, that he wasn't afraid. Well, about two weeks after that, three weeks after that, he was at the house, and we would often read the Bible together pray or just talk about stuff. And he said, I found a new job. I said, what do you be doing? He said, uh, I decided I wanted to apply for a job at the jail. I think there are people there that I can help. I think I know some of what they're going through. Well, sure enough, he got a job at the jail. But that's not where the story stops. It was months, maybe, maybe even a year or so after that, I, a member of the church told me that they knew somebody that was arrested and put in jail and asked if I could go visit her. Well, I'd visited three or four times, and most of the time she didn't make eye contact at all. And um, it seemed like we were talking through this plexiglass, and she just wanted to get out of her jail cell, and I was the only excuse that she had. So we would, we would talk, and, uh, but not much at all. But about the third or the fourth visit, she was totally changed. She looked at me straight in the eye, and we began to talk. And she said, do you know a man that works here at the jail named Gary? And I said, yes, I do. She said, he told me about Jesus, and that made all the difference. Jesus, as the Lord of our lives, it makes all the difference. It's not an add-on or a tack-on or something else. That, uh, it's not a theory. It's not some of the things that we do that are real nice and real good for other people. That Jesus is Lord, it means our lives are oriented around Him. Jesus is Lord means that He's the King. He's the leader. That Jesus is the hope of the world. We're living in a time right now where people are trying to get us to believe that Donald Trump is the hope of the world, that Joe Biden is the hope of the world, that the Republicans or the Democrats are the hope of the world. That's just one more lie. Jesus is and always has been, Lord, the hope of the world. And Simon and Matthew were witnesses that Jesus is the hope of the world. And that if a collaborator and a, an assassin can be of, of one mind, that a collaborator and assassin can be of one heart and one soul, that church, we can too. 
We can too. There's a world that needs to know that Jesus is the hope of the world. And that you and I are the ones to give witness that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. Well, Matthew and Simon were witnesses. That's what I came to talk about this morning. They were witnesses to the power of the resurrection. They were witnesses that Jesus is Lord. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, they were witnesses to abundant, His abundant grace. That's what it says in verse 33. And with great power the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. In his book, Proof, Timothy Paul John, Jones tells a story about his, adopting his middle daughter. This little girl had been in the foster system for a while. As a matter of fact, at one point, she was adopted by another family. But this other family didn't treat her like she was a part of the family. As a matter of fact, they went to Disney World and left the little girl at home while the biological children got to go to Disney World. Well, not long after they got back from Disney World, that family turned her back into the foster care system. Well, Timothy Paul Jones and his family adopted this little girl and she had outbursts and she had some behavioral problems. And he thought maybe the best thing that would be for her and for the family was, would be for them all to go to Disney World together. He told the children that they were going to Disney World and, and he thought that things would get better, but instead they got worse. The little girl began to, to lie. She began to steal food. She began to treat the rest of the family cruelly as if to guarantee that there would be no way that, that they would allow her to go with them to Disney World. Well, the day came. They went to Disney World. They rode all the rides. They waited in all the lines. They ate all the food. At the end of the day, they were totally exhausted. And he went to this, his little girl and he said, well, what did you think about it? And this is what she said. Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. And that's what grace is. Jesus gave His life on the cross for you and for me, not because we're good, not even because we're better than we had been, not because we're the best that we could be. He gave His life on the cross for you and for me to forgive all that is past, to wipe that away, to give Abundant grace to you and me because we're His. And when we receive that grace, that abundant grace, our lives begin to be changed, freed from the, the power of sin, freed from the power of guilt and shame. And that the, the power of the res, risen Christ, His Holy Spirit, lives within us to live a life that we can't live any other way. A life of grace, that not only do we receive that grace, but it's abundant grace, and that grace spills over into all of our relationships. This Tuesday, folks are voting. And afterwards, a lot of folks are going to be hurt. I don't know who's going to win. You don't know who's going to win. But we both know a lot of folks are going to be hurting and grieving. And if ever there's a time that this world needs to see and hear and experience, to witness what abundant grace looks and sounds and feels like, this is that time. That Matthew and Simon, they gave witness to abundant grace, a collaborator and assassin. They were of one mind, one heart and one soul, because they were unified in the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ. That's incredible witness. And, you know, I believe that you and I can be witnesses to that grace as well. That's, that's the grace that this hurting world needs. Maybe that this morning that you've never received that grace before. No, you've been good. You might even be better than you had been or the best that you, you thought you could be. But Jesus has more for you than that. It may be that you've never prayed that your life be oriented 
are reoriented that, that Jesus is Lord and that His Spirit, the risen Christ, live His life through you. Well, I want to pray with you that morning, this morning for that. Let's pray. Lord, we live in a, a time that, well, for us, it's, it's very different. But you know more about hard time than we do. You know more about suffering than we do. And Lord, you know more about grace than we do. This morning, may we receive that grace that you gave on the cross. The forgiveness of sin. Lord, may we receive that grace that you gave through the resurrection. A power of your Holy Spirit living within us. That, a power that, that's stronger than our weakness, a power that gives love and bitterness, a power that gives light in the middle of darkness, a power that gives hope, hope in the hard time. May we receive that forgiveness of sin and that, that abundant grace this day. And Lord, grant us grace enough that that abundant grace be spilled on others. This world is in a place where there are a lot of folks that are hurting, a lot of folks that are grieving. They need to know what abundant grace, what it looks like, what it sounds like. They need to experience it. May we be witnesses to your grace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.